Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Uh, welcome. I, last week, I forgot to say welcome to the people in the parking lot. So welcome, parking lot people. They're out there. A yeah. couple of them out there. Yeah, I went out and said hello. Um, and uh, it's good to have them with us. Not everybody's ready to come back in to the sanctuary, and that's fine. If that's what works best for you, feel free um, to stay out there. And as long as Phil can keep us hooked up to the, to, to the transmitter, we're good to go. Because I have no capacity to do that. That, that takes uh, brains that I ha haven't got. So. Um, this week, we have one meeting coming up, the property meeting, Tuesday evening at 7. Um, don't forget that if you serve on that committee. If you just like to come along because you like property, that's okay. Just come along and chat, that's fine. Um, I believe that's really the only thing that we have happening. Um, this week, We had yesterday, we were here. Um, in the sanctuary for a very joyful occasion. We baptized Harper um, uh, Ellis, and she was a doll. She was so sweet. And um, when I went to visit them during the week, so that, you know, so I wouldn't be a strange face on when she got here, uh, she came right to me. She sat on my lap. We had hugs. We had loves. And the uh, At the end of the visit, they said, wow, uh, gosh, that's just going to kill Grandpa Chris because uh, she won't even go to him. She just cries when she sees his face. <laughs> so, but Saturday, she didn't cry. She didn't cry for me. She didn't cry even when I dunked her in water three times. She didn't cry. But Chris, for the first time, said that he, she saw him without bursting into tears. So they're making progress. So that was good. <laughs> um, Anyway, Harper is uh, the, Ch the, the uh, daughter of Chad Ellis and his wife Jessica, and so it was wonderful to have their combined families and friends here yesterday to celebrate Harper's baptism. Um, I believe those are all the announcements we have, unless somebody else thinks of one. Yes, sir. Oh, Lutheran, Lutheran statements are it, down in uh, room 100. So please pick those up on your way out. All right. I'm not seeing anyone waving at me frantically. So, okay. Then, friends, let's join our hearts together as we worship God Almighty. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. We come together as the people of God. Come, come let, us let us join in, all together with each other. 
Let us build a community of worship. God be with us as we worship together. Mark's gospel makes clear that great is the press of the crowd with its countless needs to be met on Jesus and his disciples. Yet in today's gospel, Jesus advises his disciples to get away and rest, to take care of themselves. Sometimes we think that when others are in great need, we shouldn't think of ourselves at all. But Jesus also honors the caregiver's need. We are sent from Christ's table to care for others and for ourselves. Let us pray. As we gather for worship today, we look around and pay attention to where we are. We smile, smiling of those who worship with us, or as we think of friends who are gathering in other places. We recall that you, our God, are with us when we worship in ones and twos, in groups and crowds, in our homes, inside church buildings and outside in your creation. We pause in our weekly doings to gather together and be with you. Be with us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. Loving God, we recognize the times and ways we put distance between ourselves and you, between ourselves and others. We recognize the times and the ways we built walls that separate us from each other and you. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Remember, God promises steadfast love and reconciliation. God is not far away, but close. God, God loves, loves us and, and forgives, forgives us. us. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. The Old Testament lesson is from 2 Samuel. Instead of David building a house, temple, for God, God promises to establish David's house, dynasty, forever. Centuries later, after the Babylonian exile, no king sat on the throne. Even then, however, the people of Israel remembered this promise and continued to hope for a king the Messiah, God's anointed. Now when the king was settled in his house, 
and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in the house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall said to my, say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come forth from your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The psalm is Psalm 89. Psalm 89 begins on a note of praise and ends with a lament. The heart of this psalm recalls God's choice of David as king and God's covenant with him to establish an eternal dynasty. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor shall the wicked bring him down. I will crush his clothes before him, and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love are with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. He will say to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will keep my love for him forever and my covenant shall stand firm for him. I will establish his name forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his, father, if his children forsake my teaching, and do not walk according to my judgments, if they break my statutes, do not do not my commandments, I will punish their transgressions with the rod, and their iniquities with the lash. But I will not let them I will not break my covenant, nor change what has gone out of my lips. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to His line shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. He shall stand fast forevermore, like the moon, the abiding witness in the sky. The epistle lesson from, it is from Ephesians, the second chapter. The author of this letter reminds his audience that or, ordinarily they are, were not a part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, 
They are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and to peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Thanks be to God. This morning we hear from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. When Jesus sends his disciples out to teach and heal, they minister among large numbers of people. Their work is motivated by Christ's desire to be among those in need. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many of them saw them coming and going and, and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns, and they arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Genesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region. And they began to bring sit the sick on mats wherever they heard he was, and wherever he went, into the villages or the cities or the farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the good news. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Be in the spirit of prayer. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people. 
faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'll invite Janine forward. children's message is from our lesson in the book of Mark. Jesus told his disciples to go by himself to rest, for they were so busy teaching others about Jesus, they were so busy they didn't even have time to rest or get a bite to eat. Do you ever have days like that? Schoolwork, chores, running errands with family? Well, Jesus wants us to know that resting is being holy, and he realizes that we all need time to ourselves. Sometimes it's hard for us to rest, but God knows what's best for us, and we should take time for ourselves. But how can we do this? Well, sometimes we can get a book, and today I have a book about cows. Do you know why I chose a book about cows? Because today is Cow Appreciation Day. <laughs> sometimes we can even get a stuffed animal. We can hug it. We can sometimes, when we're smaller, it helps us take a nap. And sometimes we can even go out for ice cream. <laughs> Today is also National Ice Cream Day. I think that's why we thank the cows. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for work, for play, and for school. We also thank you for those times when we can get away from it all and get some rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Who knew it was National Ice Cream Day? That's amazing. I, I see ice cream in my future today. <laughs> so, this morning... Um, for the poem of the day, I chose Shel Silverstein's Rock and Roll Band. Now, the scriptures are all about building kingdoms, but just listen and see if this sort of resonates with you. If we were a rock and roll band, we'd travel all over the land. We'd play and we'd sing and we'd wear spangly things if we were a rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band and we were up there on the stand, the people would hear us and love us and cheer us. Hooray for that rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band, then we'd have millions of fans. We'd giggle and laugh and sign autographs if we were a rock and roll band. If we were a rock and roll band, the people would all kiss our hands. We'd be millionaires and have extra long hair if we were a rock and roll band. But we ain't no rock and roll band. We're just seven kids in the sand with homemade guitars and pails and jars and drums of potato chip cans. Just seven kids in the sand talking and waving our hands and dreaming and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be grand if we were a rock and roll band? So I chose that poem today because, for me, it just sort of works in there. Can you imagine being those first disciples? Can you imagine hearing those words? You're building the kingdom of God, and then looking down at the motley crew that's surrounding you and thinking, oh. There is no way. Somehow, God loves us enough that God says, we are enough. What we have is what God desires to build God's kingdom. You'll remember that Jesus had just sent his Disciples out two by two. Remember, they were peach, preaching repentance and they were casting out demons. They were healing as many people as they could. 
And as they return from their preaching expedition throughout Galilee, they were a little road weary, but so glad to be home, I'm sure. Verse 34 stands out in the very middle of the story that we just heard. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. There are three things that intrigue me about this verse. First, it's that word compassion. Jesus has a lot of compassion in Mark, but I think sometimes our understanding of that word is significantly different from Mark's understanding. But more on that in a minute. Second, I'm intrigued by these people who run ahead of Jesus in order to be right there when his boat comes to shore. Jesus calls them sheep without a shepherd. And third, I'm amazed at the way Jesus shows love and compassion for these sheep. So let's start with compassion. We might think that this word is sort of a synonym for pity or even empathy, but pity is something you can feel without being personally involved. And pity almost always carries with it the assumption that whatever or whoever receives our pity is just a little bit less important, less significant than we are. There's sort of sometimes an air of condes condensation when we're pitying someone else. We see ourselves as better than them. And even while we, if we would define compassion as empathy more than just pity, there's still that feeling that somehow we're above or separate from the people with whom we, emphasize, we empathize. When we talk about walking a mile in another person's shoes, we sort of assume that those shoes aren't going to be as comfortable or as attractive or as sturdy as our own shoes. Even when we try to feel what another feels through empathy, it's clear that these aren't our feelings. We only experience them temporarily. They still belong to the other. But compassion really means suffering with the one who suffers. The Greek word for compassion includes the root word for intestines. Compassion is something you feel in your gut. You internalize the pain of another and suffer that pain yourself to the very core of your being. When Jesus looked out on these crowds of people who had chased him around the lake, he saw people who were like sheep without a shepherd, and he felt their pain. He felt their confusion, their deep desire to know God in a way that the scribes and teachers had never shown them. He felt their hunger, not their hunger just for bread, but for love. He suffered as they suffered in the very core of his being. When Jesus looks at you and me, he has that same compassion for us too. He feels our pain, our sorrow, our frustration, and our worry. He suffers with us in our broken relationships, in our need to make ends meet, in our need and desire to be right with God. He sees us running around like sheep without a shepherd, and he calls us to walk with him as he walks with us. Now let's look at those sheep without a shepherd. I have to confess that I've always been puzzled by this business of people running along the lakeshore beating Jesus to the next beach. See, when I heard Sea of Galilee, I was thinking an ocean. I was thinking a sea. But then I realized the Sea of Galilee is just really a smaller body of water. When you think about it as a smallish sized lake, Surrounded by deep hill, steep hills, you begin to realize there's no place on that water that cannot be seen from land. No matter where the disciples rode or sailed, their boat would always be visible from the shore. Jesus was always in sight. It would have been easy to figure out where the boat was headed and in order to get there before Jesus and his disciples did. But... 
there's a big difference between being in that boat with Jesus, like his disciples, and running along the shore to catch him the moment he arrives on the beach. Taking the boat across the water may not have been intended as a shortcut to peace and quiet, but maybe being in the boat was the retreat for them. Or when you think about it, it was the only place we hear of where Jesus could ever be alone with his disciples without crowds pressing in on them. The time it took to sail to the hillside below was all the time Jesus could give his disciples to be themselves, to have a rest from their ministry, to be alone with him. And meanwhile, the people ran ahead to meet Jesus. They raced along the shore to get to the destination before he did. They were like sheep without a shepherd, running ahead of the one they should have been following. How often have I been just like that? trying to second-guess Jesus, running ahead to where I think he's going to land instead of staying in the boat with him. How often have I been dead wrong about the destination he had in mind for my life? Yet Jesus has compassion even for a sheep like me. He suffers with me in my hard-headedness and in my foolishness. He internalizes my struggle and reaches out to teach me his way. And here's the third thing about this verse that really catches my attention. Jesus also shows us that having compassion is to teach. He teaches all of those people and his disciples how to build the kingdom of God. When Jesus sent out his followers to preach repentance and to offer healing and wholeness, he was inviting those apostles, those disciples to participate in building the kingdom of God by doing the things that he did, by teaching and sharing the things that he taught, by healing and having compassion. And he offers you and I that very same invitation. We're called to share the good news with people that we know and people we don't, to offer healing and redemption, and to those who know, the, whose pain we know and feel in our very own guts. This is what it means to be part of the kingdom Jesus came to establish. The disciples didn't always get it. But when they did, the things that Jesus did and when they taught the way Jesus taught, amazing and miraculous things happened. And the kingdom of God grew. And it's still growing. We can be a part of it. But we can't be in the boat with Jesus at the same time we're running along the shore trying to get where he's going before he gets there. Many times it's our, assumption, our assumptions about what we should be doing that keep us from being what Jesus asks to be, us to be, companions in the boat, compassionate and loving. Jesus is going to go on to multiply bread and fish and feed thousands. He's going to walk on water in the middle of the night he will keep teaching his followers how to be a part of the kingdom of God by doing exactly what he does, by teaching what he teaches so that lives can be changed. In the last few verses of today's reading, we see Jesus and his disciples climb back into that boat, still hungry themselves after all the work that they've done. And just as before, they head out across the lake. This time to nearby Genesaret. When the boat arrives there, there's one more little detail that deserves our attention. Verse 53 tells us that the disciples moored the boat. They anchored it instead of dragging it up on the rocky shore as usual. 
This is the only place where we find this word anchored in the entire New Testament. It reminds me of an old spiritual, <clears throat> I've been anchored in the Lord. Are we all anchored in Christ? Is Jesus what grounds us and keeps us connected to our place in the kingdom? When the disciples land the boat, more people are waiting for Jesus. They're eager to be healed by touching the fringe of his cloak. Karen Eust, a theologian, writes that our job is to be the fringe of that cloak to the world. We might think that means scurrying around, trying to meet every single need that comes to our attention, but that kind of activity doesn't really offer compassion to anyone. It looks more like sheep without a shepherd who race ahead of Jesus instead of following him. That kind of activity keeps us from having real gut compassion for those that Jesus has called us to reach. And it keeps us from staying connected to Jesus himself. To be the fringe of Jesus' cloak, we have to be touching Jesus ourselves. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a true disciple, we need to stay in the boat with him. We need to walk with him, do what he does, and say what he says. Then we can build the kingdom of God. May it be so. Amen. I'm going to invite you to remain seated for the Apostles' Creed and the prayers of intercession. Then we'll stand when we get to the service of Holy Communion. Together, let's state that which we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Virgin Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Holy Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation.
Tend your church, O God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands recovering from natural disasters and protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Reconcile the nations, O oh God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Heal your people, O oh God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially Terry, Michelle, Harry and Kathy, Mary, Amy, Judy, Phyllis, Pauline, Ralph, Robert, Jennifer, Joan, Zach, Dale, Beverly, Ed, Hazley, Tom, Ed, Ken, Betty, Jean and Joan, Tim, Karen, Briley, Terry, Ruth, Howard and Nancy, Nevin, Steve, Pauline, Jeanette, Cassie, Pat, Betty, Woody, Homer, Darlene, Faith, Eleanor, Mary, Cindy, Barbara, Lorraine, Anna Mae, Julie, Alan, Brooke, Mabel, Ardella, Martha, Pat, and the family of Robert Warmcastle. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Nourish this congregation, O God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You lead us home, O God. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to rise in body or spirit. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is to right give him. It is truly right and good to glorify you at all times and in all places, O God. Through your living word, you created all things and pronounced them good. You made human beings in your own image, persons capable of entering into relationships both with you and with each other. You have called us as sisters and brothers to be a great family. So today we join with all your people on earth, praising your name in unending song, singing together.
Merciful God, as sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. And likewise, Jesus took a cup and after giving thanks, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And we remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. O holy God, creator of all people and world, send now upon this bread and cup your life-giving spirit. May this outpouring of the promised spirit transfigure this Thanksgiving meal, that this bread and this cup may become for us the body and blood of Christ. And as we partake of this holy meal, fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we may be one body and one spirit in Christ. All glory and honor is yours. Almighty God, now and forever. And hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the, and the glory forever, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come, as we prepare ourselves to receive this holy sacrament, we remember that we are part of a living body of Christ in the whole world. And we each come to this table with different needs and come in different ways. The bread represents our brokenness, so I ask you to partake when you are ready. When you eat of this bread, my friends, Remember that it is the body of Christ broken for you and for me. Let the people say amen. amen. Good job, CJ. And as we partake of this, the cup of blessing, we acknowledge our unity in Christ Jesus, so we hold our cup and all partake as one. Drink this, for it is the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. Let the people say amen. amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with our own life in your name we pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
And now the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. <laughs>